The title of this session is A Landscape Approach to Management and Conservation of Natural Resources, Change of Paradigm or New Illusory Fad. Who made up that title? <laughs> okay. Um, so th this is co-organized by C4 and ECRAF, and it revolves around um, uh, a landscape approach to ecological-based management, which has been around for a long time. Um, without going into the details, because the presenters will do that, what we will do is that we will have uh, a presentation by Robert Nazi from C4 and Anja from, from ECRAF. Um, and uh, after that, we will have an open series of questions and answers for about 10 minutes. And uh, after that, we have organized four respondents to the presentations and maybe to the following questions as well. I'll present the respondents as when we get to that point. And following uh, the respondents' uh, uh, statements, we will have a group work which Robert is organizing, so I will hand it over to him at that point. Um, and we will have just huddle around a few questions, I guess, inside the room. Um, and um, um, after some huddling, come back and have a quick uh, reporting back from those groups to, to uh, round off the session. And we plan that all of this will be done within two and a half hours. So that's, that's the session. And by that, I, I will ask Robert and Anja to kick off by, by the presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, do, I need, do I need the mic or do you hear me clear? If you accept for the French accent. It's better with the mic? OK. Doesn't fix the accent, probably. Anyway, so we are going to, no, I'm not going to sit here. Uh, uh, so you have the title of the, of the session, and, and that's really something that has been uh, running in our mind for a while. I mean, uh, we have had for, for a long time evolving concepts, uh, and I'm not going to go back to the ecosystem management or watershed management beyond, but just to go back to uh, a little bit more than a decade ago, you had the ecosystem approach that was the overarching uh, goal of the CBD and that was sustained by the Malawi principles. Uh, and, but then in the end, the ecosystem approach, I mean, not in the end, but uh, has been more or less, uh, I, I would say, hijacked by the conservation lobby, mainly. And then on the other side, you had the CGIAR, and that was mainly the work of uh, Jeff Sayer and, and Bruce Campbell that came back with this idea of integrated natural resource management, INRM which was uh, another avatar of the ecosystem approach. Or the and then what we have today, it's the landscape approach. So the question is that, is there really something different? And if it's different, what, what makes the difference? And how can we make sure that this landscape approach is going to make a difference if it is going to make a difference? And then the classical question that everybody asks, and you have heard several times, is what is a landscape? And you can go back to the fifth century in Germany or in England, that was a small administrative unit of land. Uh, in the 16th century for Bruegel, it was the bird's eye viewpoint of a Flanders landscape, of a Flemish countryside. In the 30s, that was the, in part of the domain of geography and a subset of a region. In the 1970s, we move to, from, natural to, from natural to human landscape. And finally, a uh, landscape, it's, it's quite a diffuse concept uh, that does not necessarily have a fixed boundaries or very hard limits, but in fact, it's something that lies before your eyes and in your mind, and it's a place where people are living and they are interacting with their environment, and they are acting on their environment. So it's, it's something which is... It's, it's a bit like a forest, I mean, sort of. It's very difficult to dis define it properly, but when you see it, you know what it is. So, and, and that, to illustrate that, uh, that this, this is the same things, the same landscape at different scale. I mean, if, if you zoom it, it's at the farm, then it becomes at the village level, and then at the city level, then at the region, then at the country level. So, all these are perfectly valid landscape. And, and, and depending on which 
part you position yourself, which scale you position yourself, these things have different properties. Some are emerging, some are linked to the scale, some are linked to the size. And if you are this uh, small, older farmer looking at this landscape, which is mainly rice here, uh, what would you want as uh, trying to maintain, to have this uh, landscape sustainable in terms of maintaining ecosystem services, biodiversity, livelihood, productivity? What, what, what can you do to help this person, if this person can help, or if they, know, they don't know more than you, in terms of how do you want to intervene in this whole system in terms of management? Because that's the purpose of the landscape approach. And so the, we have to move beyond concept into something that is practical in some sense to implement. And, and then you have a whole system. I mean, you have the individual differences. I mean, the sort of what I would like to do is probably different than what Jaburi would like to do and will be different than what Anya wants to do. Then you have my, the various network. I mean, sort of what this group as the Global Landscape Forum would like to do with the landscape is probably very different than maybe what the negotiator or the COP would do with this landscape. And then you have the external physical factor. I mean, so that I may want to do something in the landscape, but uh, if I want to grow maize and the, previous, the rainfall is 200 millimeter per year, I'm unlikely to do anything because I'm constrained by the external physical factor. Some of them I can change through fertilization, for example. Some of them I cannot change. And then you have the personal preferences. I mean, a sort of, does this person want to be a farmer in the end, or does he or she prefer to go to town and open a, a trade? Something, a small trade union, a small commerce. You don't know. So that all this system and the management objective uh, creates the behavior. That, that's what will decide what the person will do or will not do at the landscape. And that's, in the end, what you want to change or what do you want to steer in, in the direction where the community or the, the, how can you say that's not necessarily us, but the sign, but... The, the society has some things, it, it's the best trajectory for the landscape. And then for that, we have very good conceptual model. And uh, there are many, I mean, so we have just put a, a, a small uh, subset here, in, in integrative science for society and environment, the pressure and pulse model, the DPSIR uh, classic of the OECD, the human appropriation of net production. These are all models that tell you, in theory, what you could, should do for something like landscape to be sustainable. The problem is that how do we move from this good conceptual model to make something which is operational, something that works, something that we can tell to the policymaker or to the negotiator or to the small order. This is how you can intervene in your landscape to have a better life, to improve your productivity, uh, to protect the environment. Sometimes you can do everything at the same place, sometimes it's not possible. So that's, this is how you deal with the, the how you can deal with the, the, the trade-offs. So our limited answer to, to this big question is that in the framework of the forestry and agroforestry uh, CGIR research program, we have developed this uh, sustainable landscape initiative, which is uh, really about providing hard evidence on key indicators important to landscape management, provide uh, an information platform for decision making, uh, backstopping uh, for data management, data mining, data analysis, uh, to allow greater cohesion, interdependence, and alignment of stakeholders within as well as across the landscape, and, and in the end, really to close the gap between the intention and the implementation in terms of the landscape approach. Uh, this is where we are now in terms of the Sentinel landscape in FTA. Uh, there are one in Borneo, Sumatra, uh, in Mekong, Western Ghats, Afro Mountain Forest, Central Africa, uh, Sahel, uh, Eastern Amazon, Western Amazon, Nicaragua, Honduras. And you have things that are not geographically bounded, but that are thematically, thematically bounded. That's, there is one which is about the overall global oil palm value chain and one which is about the, the dynamics of tropical forest after harvesting. So this is where we are, it's far from perfect, it's limited, but that's, we need to, to start and we have limited resources and, and you will see that one of the questions we'll ask you is that it's, are you willing to, to help in, in this effort? Uh, I will stop here because that was the easiest part and that becomes complicated. I will give the mic to Anya that will explain that to us. Trying to. Thanks, Robert. 
So first thing I have to actually figure out how to operate this. So um, what the Sentinel Landscape Initiative is actually really doing, what are we doing across these landscapes? First of all, we looked actually at existing data networks matrices that have long-term um, time series data. There's the LDSF, the Land Degradation Surveillance Framework, which has been done by SIAD and ECRAFT, and is built on 20,000 ground truthing points in Africa. And I will show that a bit later. The Poverty Environmental Network, it's about 110 villages in the forest margin, uh, done by C4. Um, the Agincourt is one of the health surveillance sites of the INDEPS. I don't know who's familiar with the INDEPS network. The INDEPS network is a global network of sites on health surveillance, some of them going back 40 years. This particular site that we're working with is going back 15 years, monitoring 15,000 households on health. Uh, the Progress Out of Poverty, a nice, um, uh, a, a nice um, project by the Garmin Foundation, which has taken the standard of living survey of the World Bank and um, made it site specific. And um, in from the International Forest Resource Institution, which is the network on forest governance and um, equity. So we looked at all of those and actually used the elements and combined them into a new research framework that we are actually implementing in a standard way across all the sites that Robea has just shown, which does two things. A, we're actually filling the gap, but we're also making sure that the data that we are collecting is actually valued to all of these networks and it's feeding into their databases. So these are the landscapes indicators. I'm not going to read all of them. They are basically not that complicated. Productivity, livelihood, policy, environment, and social. This is the indicators that we can construct at the moment. These data sets that I've just shown before together will give you those indicators. And as I've just said, we actually invented, well, put it together in a new research frame, uh, methodology framework to do that in all these sites. Um, the main, the land health surveillance work that we do is really going beyond the forest cover. Somebody this morning in planetary was uh, pointing out there's this new publication in Science Out, just a new map of the change in tree cover. We are interested in looking into what's the impact of tree cover on livelihood outcomes. So essentially the question is, okay, tree cover is changing, but so what? With the indicators, we have a whole bunch of indicators that allow us to actually look exactly into the, or the effect of tree cover change. Here we have um, soil organic carbon as an indicator for soil fertility. Over here, we have texture. Down there, we have the erosion potential, so probability that this particular uh, pixel is going to erode, and this is soil pH. So these, this, um, this model actually allows us to look into, okay, if the land cover is changing, has it resulted in a change in land health, and with that, has it resulted in a change in environmental services available? So it's a typical, this is one of the indices that we're using. It's a probability of a closed canopy. Um, it's for the Amazon 2001 and 2011. So you can nicely monitor the deforestation. But as I said, it isn't just about looking the change of tree cover. It is really, what does it mean for the people that are living in those landscapes? Okay. So here we have an example from the Western Ghats, and I think, Jabu, you're going to talk a bit more about this, right? Um, so here we have the same, what i just shown for the, for the Amazon. It's a probability of a closed canopy, 2001 to 2011. And you can see there are numerous changes. In some parts, you have an increase in tree cover, where in other parts, you have a decrease of the actual trees in the landscape. And as a result of that, where you actually lose the trees, you have uh, drying of the surface, so you're changing the soil property, you're changing actually the land health. Here what we have done is, that's, that's where we're trying to go to, is if we are able to actually model the properties of the land health, can we then look into villages which are in these environments and see how, have their, how has their environment changed and how does it actually affect their livelihoods? So this is an example where we used uh, the climate change and food security uh, villages. They have done a baseline on 15 sites across, across the globe. And they ask a question to the farmer saying, in the last 10 years, what are the changes you have made to crops and land management? And here what we have done 
is we just used the location and we modeled basically their land health in the location where those villages are. And what you can see here is that from going from the left to the right, this is an increase in soil fertility. So villages on this part have a higher soil fertility versus those that are here. And in correspondence to that, you have the texture. So this goes with very sandy soils and very low fertility. Here you would have more clay soils with a higher fertility. And the dots is proportionally to the diversity of changes people made. So what we actually very nicely can see from here is that if you look into um, the environment these villages are placed, you can clearly model that farmers' decision making is very much influenced by the environmental constraint factor that's in their, in their um, uh, which they're living in. So that goes back to the picture that Robert was just saying. The question here is then, if this is the inherent limitation of the site, we as people that actually want to advise an intervention, we need to actually talk about that there isn't much you can do if you're sitting in a sandy soil with no water. We have to take this into account and if you want people to actually adapt your interventions, you have to tailor make them to the environmental context those people are living. Um, this is something that we're working at the moment. This is the PEN data set for Africa. So what, here you see this is the different uh, countries where you have various villages that were actually analyzed in the PEN data sets. Here again are our indices, the forest index, soil organic carbon and erosion. These are data from 2011. We are actually cleaning the data sets at the moment to have decadal um, data for land health, so we can go back, since we're working on a remote sensed data, we can go back to the 80s. And the objective is for each of the villages and each the re all of the regions that we work in to actually construct back the trajectory. So 30 years before, what was the vegetation cover and what was the health of the land that they actually have access to? And can we then actually group these villages into groups where you have villages where the trajectory turned from you cut the forest, but they actually kept the environmental health, so they actually um, can, they basically profited from cutting down the forest. Do we then find that all of the villages actually improved and benefited? What about those people that live in places where you have actually cut down the forest and it actually resulted in a drastic change of land health? So that's the question we're trying to answer. Here is the example of, uh, I talked about the land health surveillance work. Um, the data set is 24 rural villages. It's next to the Kruger National Park in South Africa. It's a former homeland, 14,000 households, 48,000 people, and they have been monitored for since 1992. We use this data set um, to actually look into the effect. Can we actually say that people that have trees, does it affect people's food security? And by doing the analysis on that data set, we could clearly actually link, which is not an impact, but it's an association, that households that actually had trees in their homestead yards were three times more likely to feed their families and be food secure. When they had it in their fields, it dropped a little bit down to two times. But this is an, just an example of showing to you that the data sets are out there, the indicators are there. It's a question of how do we bring them together and can we actually make use of the data that's already there. Um, this is the, land, the landscape portal. Is we, have, we have established over the last two years, we have established a data sharing platform which is publicly available. All the data that we are generating in the Sentinel landscapes are actually uploaded on this uh, platform. The, email address at the moment it's still under um, eCraft Geoscience Lab and it's just about to be changed to the landscape portal. So as Robea said, one of the objectives of this initiative is not only to produce indicators and do science, but it is to bring partners together to share their data and to share the efforts and discuss what one can do together. So. Um, thank you. That, that would be for my part. Um, we'll come back to this um, at the end of this discussion, I think. This is the emails if you're interested to actually find out more. Uh, Robert's email, my email, and Tor Wagen, who is doing the modeling and the remote sensing. Thank you.
Thanks. We, I think we will actually come back to this right away, uh, because now is an opportunity to ask questions to Robert and Anja uh, on, on their presentation. Who wants to go first? Thank you very much. Um, I'm Michael Bucchi, uh, European Commission. I'm part of the negotiation team for the uh, European Union. Um, I, I was looking at this, uh, thanks a lot for, for this presentation. I was looking at that and, and wondering, um, in relation to the, to the title of your intervention, how we can use that type of information to convince the, not only the other parties, but also our decision makers at home. Um, I'm, I'm talking about my own experience, I'm right in the middle of uh, a director general for climate action and a director general for uh, development and cooperation. And these people, they, they, it's like that they don't talk to each other with the same words. Uh, the the uh, monitoring and evaluation criteria or headings or indicators that they use are just so different uh, that there is a suspicion that th there would be a hidden agenda when we are proposing things like climate, smart agriculture, like there would be one way of imposing climate objectives on development money. And on the other side, when we try to explain that maybe Red Plus is a little more complicated than tons of carbon and that some more programmatic elements in relation to social or environmental dimensions are needed to achieve results on mitigation. It's like we are burdening the red plus concept too much. So I, I wonder how you can articulate these findings uh, in, into, into concrete um, um, yeah, guidance for decision makers, uh, things that, that, that make sure at least that they are using the same words. We, we are um, very much interested in the concept of climate smart agriculture and these three pillars of, of climate smart agriculture, uh, productivity, resilience, and um, mitigation aspects, um, however it is designed. It's, it's very useful, but it's just another concept that adds to a proliferation of concepts. So the, my, it's, it's a question, what, what, what will be, how would you phrase the top priorities for, for decision making and so that we can bridge this gap between the climate spheres and the development spheres. If there is another question, we give them some more time to answer this. Can we, can we sell this both as climate action and development action without upsetting either side? That's pretty much what you ask. Is there any other question or everybody's eager to hear the answer to that question? So please, Robert. Well, I mean, uh, we had this discussion uh, at, at lunch with, with, Mik with Mikael, and, uh, and as uh, our colleague from Germany said, I mean, we are fighting against gravity. Uh. So gravity is pushing, pushing us down or in, into sectors. So the forester talks to the forestry, and uh, agriculture talks to agriculture, and then you have the, this sort of a silo mentality. <coughs> The only message that we can deliver, it's not the one about the complexity, about the, because then it becomes fuzzy, then it's not something that you can communicate to a decision maker. What we can do at our level, in terms of scientists and our research and development community, is we need to develop the method and the tools so that we can have these obvious results that show that if you don't consider something at scale, taking into account the various components, then you lose a large part of the information and you take the wrong decision. So in a sense, with the uh, Agencourt, uh, that there is a clear... If you say to the people, oh, you, you need to plant tree, and uh, agriculture will say, no, if you plant tree, you get a lot of birds that eat your, your crop and it doesn't work, or you get a lot of pests, then someone will say, yeah, but if you plant tree, if you go to a decision maker and say, if you have three in your backyard, your family has three times more chance to be fed the whole year, then it's something that percolates in the mind and that's because the issue is very important, can go across sectors. But as I, as I said, I mean, it's sort of, we are really fighting against gravity and and uh, I think that we need to continue in developing the, the proper method and, and, and trying to get the proper results and trying to convince people to join the effort and, and to show that, in fact, having a landscape approach is not a, a threat to the, to the sector. That, that, that's the best way to optimize many sectors in one place or in a given place. That's the only 
answer I can give, but maybe Peter has an answer also because it's it's one of the things he likes about. The gravity analogy is good. Um, I'll just ask for another question. There's a question. Yes. yes. Lutz Fermann from the University of Göttingen. I really enjoyed both presentations. Um, my question refers a little bit to the scaling issue. Uh, Robert, as you said, uh, it is a, a critical issue if we talk about landscapes and also if we try to analyze these relations, uh, whether it's correlations or cause and effect relationships is, is another issue. But uh, we have to be very careful with um, conclusions because we have to uh, consider the scale and uh, th this example of the the trees in the garden um, and the household um, income or well-being or whatever is is also from my point of view a little bit critical um, because it's not necessarily a cause and effect relationship. You. That's a very good question. I hope I said it's an association. I hope I didn't say that it was a causal effect because it isn't. It could just simply mean the people that are actually more caring for their families also happen to have a fruit tree in their garden. So it's not the it's not it's not a that that's just it's not a causal effect. But the question about the scale is um, I think um, what we are trying to do at the moment is we having. Um, the, the matrices that I showed are taking data at various scale, working at the village, household level, landscape, and plot level. Um, at the moment, we have uh, three of our landscapes are taking data at the moment, and we have our first analytical workshop in March, and all the rest should actually have the first set of data in by the end of next year, uh, yeah, 2014. So this is actually part of what this initiative is trying to do, is answering that question. We would like to, by the essence outcome of this, not only to have indicators, but we would actually like to be able to advise what question you have to ask at what scale. Might be the same question at all the scales, but that's, that's enough. Um, I thought about an answer to, my, uh, to Mike's question, Michael's question before, and. Um, I'm going to answer in this way. We had a little discussion last night. Uh, what do we do on the next, in the next landscape forum? And then this time around, we're kind of limited to agriculture and forestry because that's the genesis of, of the forum this time around. But next time, maybe we should invite the mining sector, the infrastructure sector, the energy sector, and the cities. And on top of that, the finance institutions. Then we will have a real landscapes forum. And you will have some interesting challenges in the commission to explain things. Um, okay, one more question before we ask the respondents. Ladies first, sorry. Uh, my point is very complementing uh, to what has been raised already. I was, I, I'm a landscape ecologist working in a transdisciplinary team where there is economists, there is a social scientist, and though we try to follow a landscape approach, the meaning of landscape differs of how I interpret it or I, how I understand it or how a social scientist would like to understand it or how he or she views it. So, I mean, uh, the scale becomes, again, I want to reiterate, the sca scale becomes a very crucial e element of of, um, a point of interest when you talk about addressing landscapes and I think maybe the, uh, we need to reconstruct the whole meaning of landscape or to arrive at a common understanding of um, I, I, I personally wanted to join this forum because I saw the tagline on the website that we want to arrive at a common language of understanding landscapes. And that's what I'm missing until now. I'm, I'm sure for a few hours to go, we'll have some at least entry point to understand that. Thanks. Uh, so the question was, what is the common language? Or? Yeah. Okay. Maybe we're not ready to answer that yet, but can we, can we, can we, can we leave, park that to the discussion we're going to have soon? Thank you. I think now is a good time to ask the, the four eminent persons that have been asked to think about the answers a little bit longer. And I, I don't know if the, is, I think you should perhaps come up here, but we don't have to have all four of you sitting up here, but if you could come up and sit or stand up in the front as, as you present your things. Do they have PowerPoints? Yes. Oh, there are PowerPoints. Excellent. So the first 
uh, respondent is uh, Professor Ruth de Vries from Columbia University. You spoke, spoke before in, in the opening sessions. You may not need much further introduction. Uh, and you have, a, you have a very long experience of working with all sorts of technologies and approaches to landscape. So I'll leave it to you to respond. Ruth, please. How's that? Okay, good. All right, uh, thank you. So I wanted to follow up by um, moving to a landscape which is a very commodity-driven landscape. So we've talked a lot about smallholder landscapes, which of course are extremely important. But the more and more urban we become as a species, the more and more our commodities are going to become coming. They have to come from our landscapes or seascapes. And uh, these commodity-oriented landscapes will become more and more important. So for me, a landscape approach in these commodity-driven um, landscapes is about balancing the, uh, the multiple objectives and coming to some management which enables a way to think about not just production of the commodity, but how to achieve the production while maintaining other services of that landscape, be it watershed protection or um, forest uh, biodiversity or carbon or what have you. So I wanted to talk about this example, which is probably fairly known to many of you, uh, in uh, Mato Grosso, Brazil, in the southeastern part of the Amazon and the success in reducing deforestation. And to me, it seems like a fantastic success because the first time I went to this landscape was in um, 2002, 2003, when the deforestation rate was at its peak. And it was quite impressive in the rate of deforestation. And it's drawn off, come down quite dramatically. Uh, and I would argue that that's because a landscape approach, well, many reasons, but one reason because a landscape approach has uh, uh, taken hold. So. This is, as I said, a very commodity-driven landscape. In the first part of the last decade, we saw uh, high rates of deforestation, um, which were driven mostly by conversion for pasture. But the rate of deforestation was uh, coupled pretty closely with the price of soy. So this is a rather complicated graphic, but if you look at the orange uh, part of the bar in this, uh, in this bar chart. That's the, from our remote sensing work, that's the um, area deforested that was subsequently used for soy. So it was in that, at that time scale, about 10% of all the deforestation was for expansion of soy, but that was very closely linked with the, uh, with the prices or the profitability of soy. In the second half of the decade, that became decoupled, and the uh, rate of deforestation reduced dramatically overall, and even further, the proportion of deforestation that was being used for subsequently for soy production dropped to about 2%. So there was an overall drop in deforestation and an even further drop in the deforestation for soy. Uh, and the coupling with prices became um, decoupled. So we can see here the, uh, the really dramatic reduction in deforestation in all of the Am legal Amazon and particularly in the state of Brazil. Uh, we've heard reports of recent increase in deforestation in the, it's been in quite in the news in the last few days of uh, increase of 28%. But I would say 28% of a low number is a pretty low number. So that up, uptick is really still quite, uh, um, doesn't take away from the success in reducing deforestation. But there's no end to, end to this story, really. There's always pressures on this landscape for more. So it's not like there's been success and we can just move on to the next. Um, so it has been quite dramatic. At the same time, I want to go to this one. At the same time, um, the drop in deforestation did not result in a decline in the increase in, in production of the important commodities from that landscape, which are soy and um, cattle. So even though deforestation rates fell dramatically, 
uh, the intensification of production on low productivity lands led to further increases in soy and, and cattle. And you can see this here, zooming into one part of this landscape, that big green blob that you see is the uh, Shingu Indigenous Reserve, which is, um, uh, with the deforestation, has been hemmed in uh, by clearing. And in the first part of the decade, which is on your right, uh, we see lots of deforestation and quite a few orange spots, which is that deforestation which subsequently is used for cropland, primarily soy. And on your left side is that same area in the second part of the decade, and you see very little, less deforestation overall, but very little of those orange <laughs> uh, spots, uh, so that most of the increase in soy was coming from already cleared pasture, not from clearing of new forest. So instead of the forest going directly to cropland, uh, you can see at the top there, the, the, the path was from forest to pasture, low productivity, and then conversion to cropland. So that's an intensification process. Oops. So why, what happened, many, uh, many, Things happened at the same time, so of course it's hard to sort out what exactly caused uh, this drop in, in um, deforestation. Clearly, the market crash was a big part of the story. People estimate that that was about, may be about half, 50% of the drop may have been attributable to the drop in the market. But a lot of other aspects happened as well. There was the soy moratorium, which was pressure from the European buyers to buy deforestation-free soy. There was improvement in um, monitoring capabilities on the part of the Brazilian government, who have had very good monitoring capabilities. There's some high, high, um, high profile enforcement of the very strict laws in Brazil for uh, deforestation, there were credit policies, there was this intensification of production, both in terms of the um, heads per hectare for cattle and for the soy per area. So a lot of things happened at the same time, but the state um, government and the national government took the issue of deforestation uh, seriously and put these policies in place to reduce deforestation. One can argue that whether that would have happened if the market hadn't crashed and the, and the profitability had reduced is, is something for the economists to, um, to tell us about. We're the remote sensors who, who look for these patterns. So this is an example where in this commodity-driven landscape, um, land sparing really was a, 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 a reality that we had an intensification of production and that left the uh, forest standing. Instead of uh, expanding soy into the forest, it was left standing and the, the uh, lower productivity areas were intensified for production. But is land sparing really um, realistic in, uh, in different places? I think we've, there's been quite a bit of work recently, and I think the, the basic bottom line conclusion is, yes, there are examples of successful land sparing, but that does not happen spontaneously. We cannot just say if we intensify production, then um, forests or other um, areas will be left unclear. That will not happen spontaneously, but it can happen, and there are examples where that has happened when there are policies and incentives in place to protect the forest coupled with intensification. That's when we see the, uh, the examples. So to me, that's a, that's a landscape approach to go from, go from a single focus on, um, on producing the commodities to a multi-objective focus on producing the commodities and maintaining the uh, services from the um, other services from the forest for the landscape. So then we always have to ask ourselves if we, we have these success stories and we can find other success stories around the world, but are they really sustainable? There's so much pressure for commodities, so much pressure for uh, clearing. Um, can we expect that these will have more success stories and that these 
these success stories that we do have won't succumb to, uh, to pressure. Well, we don't know what happens in the future, but we do know that uh, governance is an enormous uh, part of the uh, question about whether these um, multi-objective landscapes are sustainable over the long run. And the, uh, we know that the exports uh, of the soybeans from Brazil were previously, up until about 2005, dominated by um, exports to Europe, and that that is going more and more to Asia. So we can ask ourselves, are, is that same demand for deforestation-free products going to be maintained, which was a, a major part of the story for why, why we had reduction in deforestation. Again, intensification of, um, of landscapes is not problem free in terms of other environmental issues like agro agrochemicals, pesticides, um, so on and so forth. And we always have to be thinking about the leakage issue, whether the um, clearing goes to some other state, some other country, some other part of the world. Uh, how, trans oh, almost finished Peter, how transferable is this story in Mato Grosso to other commodity-driven landscapes around the world? Well, um, it seems that the really key issue is governance here. And if we look at the drivers of deforestation in um, other tropical forest countries, which are um, for commodity landscapes or agricultural exports, commercial production, urbanization, and so on, there are many other tropical forests that face those same pressures. But there are very few um, of those countries that have the similar governance capacity to Brazil uh, that we would expect would be needed to have other success stories such as this. So again, uh, thinking beyond the very important issue of, of the smallholders to the commodity driven landscapes, which are going to become more and more frequent and thinking how we can apply our landscape approach, landscape thinking to those types of landscapes as well. So thank you. Thanks, Ruth. That's a good uh, illustration of how to reason around the landscape and what's sustainable. Um, I note that the assumption here is that more forest is more sustainable, but that's something for another session to discuss. Um, our next respondent is Sakile Kuketso from the CBD Secretariat. Is that correct? Um, I, I don't know anything more about you, so if you, you can please introduce yourself a little bit more completely. And uh, do you have a PowerPoint as well? No? Okay, so please go ahead. Thank you. Good, thank you. Um, so, my name is Sakile Kogetsu, I work for the CBD Secretariat. I'm the program officer responsible for the program uh, of work on dry and subhumid lands biodiversity and the cross-cutting issue on climate change. I am from Botswana and my uh, background is in dry lands um, but also uh, climate change. So I'm here representing my uh, colleague Catalina who is responsible for the program of work on forest biodiversity. Um, so before I start, I'd just like to find out how many people uh, know about the strategic plan for biodiversity, because that is my jumping off point. So two people in the room, three? Okay, okay. So uh, I'll do a 30 second overview of the strategic plan. Um, in 2010, at our conference of parties, the parties adopted the strategic plan for biodiversity. It has five goals, um, and these goals relate to underlying, sorry, addressing the underlying causes of biodiversity loss, um, addressing the direct uh, drivers of biodiversity loss, strengthening conservation of ecosystems, uh, genes, and species, um, enhancing the benefits uh, of all. So the, of all, sorry, the benefits to all of biodiversity and then strengthening institutional mechanisms. So the strategic plan has 20 targets, the Aichi biodiversity targets, and these are arranged um, under the different um, uh, goals. So um, 
by 2020, the, so that for all except two of the IT targets, that 2020 is the deadline date for achieving the targets. Um, so basically, in order to achieve the vision or the mission of the strategic goal, which is to uh, halt the loss of biodiversity so that um, ecosystems can be resilient and continue to provide um, services uh, for human beings. Um, in order to achieve that, we're going to, in many cases, have to use the landscape approach. So for example, um, goal B, uh, which is address about addressing the direct drivers of biodiversity loss, um, we want to halt the loss of um, habitats, uh, habitat degradation, um, habitat fragmentation. But not only that, we aim to improve or to, um, the IG Target 7 aims for sustainable production landscapes, so sustainable agriculture, sustainable forestry, sustainable aquaculture, uh, sorry, uh, sustainable fisheries. Um, or for example, target 15, which aims to reduce, uh, sorry, to increase the resilience of ecosystems um, and to restore degraded ecosystems. Mm -hmm. So there's five targets um, in the strategic plan which, are, which have uh, quantitative area targets. That's target five, um, which as I said, it aims to uh, reduce habitat loss, um, to bring it to half, and where feasible to zero. Um, target 11, which aims not only to Im improve or increase protected area coverage terrestrially to 17% and marine to six, uh, 10, sorry, did I say terrestrial to 17%, marine to 10%, but it also aims to improve governance of protected areas. And then um, target 15 to restore at least 15% of degraded lands. So in order to achieve this, Again, the landscape approaches are interesting. But there's many challenges. I just want to highlight three of them. Um, I think the, the previous presentation um, made it very clear that we don't actually have enough space. Uh, we don't have enough land to increase protected area coverage and at the same time in, uh, improve, in, improve agricultural production and at the same time build human settlements and at the same time do all the things that we need to do uh, to feed 9 billion people, to clothe them, um, to house them. Also, um, even though we have made some, uh, we have some achievements when it comes to conservation and restoration of biodiversity. We really need to upscale uh, our efforts in order by 2020 to have achieved some of the things that we have set for ourselves. So how do we do this? I mean, if we, if we all agree that we haven't really, we haven't really um, been able to finance biodiversity conservation and ecosystem restoration adequately, how are we going to be able to make the case to finance ecosystem restoration of biodiversity conservation at a larger scale, at a landscape scale? And this brings us to the point of my presentation, which is perhaps we need to look beyond um, the traditional sources of finance and look at, for example, um, uh, public programs that have soci socioeconomic and development objectives. Um, so, for example, these are projects that have the aim to address poverty and to achieve development, whatever your definition of development is, whether it's community development or economic growth. Um, so these programs encompass social, welfare programs, employment guarantee schemes, short-term employment schemes, labor-intensive public works, short-term, once-off uh, public programs. These programs, their main purpose is to alleviate poverty. That's what they're put in place for. Um, sometimes to stabilize economies, as we saw in 2008. But many of these programs, they result in improved physical infrastructure, so roads, bridges, uh, things like this. Sometimes they result in improved social capital, so uh, nursery, sorry, um, 
early childhood education or health, community health. And a lot of the time, they also result in improved natural capital, so uh, biodiversity conservation, ecosystem restoration, soils, protection, water, things like that. I highlight um, two countries that have actually been able to merge um, both the development or the socioeconomic objectives with their actually um, the protection of natural capital. Um, and so, for example, the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, which guarantees rural life, um, adults uh, of households in rural um, areas 100 days of guaranteed wage employment um, if they agree to do manual unskilled labor. So they'll have 100 days guaranteed, and this could be 100 days one adult or three adults 100 days split, which is 33.3. Um, and the kind of public works that this scheme um, uh, does is things like uh, water conservation, water harvesting, afforestation, uh, restoration of water bodies, land development, flood control, things like that. So um, if, for example, this uh, scheme were to be implemented at a landscape level, we could perhaps see uh, better outcomes or improved outcomes such that we could reach the strategic plan for biodiversity. The second one is the quite famous one, which is working for water in South Africa, uh, which uses uh, employment scheme as well to um, clear alien invasive vegetation from ecosystems. Um, they have an annual budget of four million, over four million US dollars a year ongoing, and so there's a lot of political support because it is viewed as an employment guarantee scheme. At the same time, they've been able to, pr to show benefits for um, uh, water availability. So just to sum up, these programs, they offer great opportunity for the conservation and restoration of ecosystems at a large, large enough scale that we would see uh, benefits for biodiversity, for ecosystems, but also uh, for livelihoods. And I just want to underline that it's an equation, it's a two-way equation, so these programs offer solutions for landscape, for management of biodiversity at landscapes. But actually, biodiversity conservation and ecosystem restoration also provide opportunity, economic opportunities at um, different scales. So uh, job creation, socioeconomic development, these kind of things. Um, and so following on our COP decision from the, pre the um, latest COP in Hyderabad last year, the CBD Secretariat is um, initiating a global study to see um, how could we use these programs um, to achieve some of the IT targets. And the, we, we, uh, we would like to understand the potential of these programs, um, how we can actually contribute simultaneously to livelihood, social, economic um, objectives, but also to restoration. So we should be hopefully able to, to um, present these findings um, at the next landscape. Stay. Thank you. Thanks, Akira. It sounds a little bit dramatic when you say that we don't have enough land. First of all, I don't agree with that statement. Uh, and secondly, maybe we should also check how much labor we have and how much capital we have. So we get land, labor, and capital into the equation. But thank you for your respond, uh, comments. And, and uh, we will now turn to the third respondent, who at least I know a little better. Uh, Terry Sunderland is a principal scientist at C4. And um, he often uh, has comments about things that Robert and Anya does. So you, here you have another go. Please. Was that positive? Yes, <laughs> always. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, the formalizing of a landscape approach in Cameroon uh, that has evolved over a period of uh, 15 to 20 years. Uh, I was based there for, for many years and was involved in this particular process. And so it sort of answers the call of the, the, um, uh, the symposium title, you know, is the landscape approach uh, something that is an illusory fad or something that's actually well established? 
uh, and I hope to prove that we have some, some historical perspective here that shows that there is some, some uh, precedent in terms of uh, long-term establishment of the landscape approach. And basically, um, Cameroon has a very unique land use classification called technical cooperation units. Um, and they are essentially were, were centered on conservation concessions and protected areas where the old-fashioned ICDPs, Integrated Conservation Development Projects, were, were active. And they had this rather loose set of uh, land use classifications around protected areas called buffer zones, and then there were agroforestry zones, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the Ministry of Environment and Forestry, which was um, split off from the Ministry of Agriculture in 1992, required um, a, a re rethinking of the, uh, the uh, conservation approach and, and coined this term technical operations units, but didn't properly define them. Um, and it was only in 2003 there, there was a, a forest uh, environment sector program, which was a co uh, coalition of the Cameroon government and external donors, came up with uh, a very clear definition of what a technical operations unit is. And there you can see it. And, uh, is a delimited geographical area based on eco ecological, socioeconomic, cultural, and political characteristics for the enhancements of integrated landscape management, including all stakeholders, involving all stakeholders. Now, this could have been written yesterday. It could have been written uh, in any of the landscape papers that have come out in the last two or, two or three years, but this was actually written 10 years ago. So we have a, a very strong basis for the definition of a landscape approach within this, uh, this political entity. And basically, it was focused on a uh, particip participatory management approach and a tool for implementation of both environmental and, um, and forest policy. So why was the TOU concept adopted? I, as I mentioned, it was sort of grew out of the whole conservation concession uh, program. Um, but also, there was a strong focus for the donors to not focus solely on conservation, but to look at the, the livelihood aspects of, uh, of uh, protected areas as well. Um, but also to, to fundamentally uh, realize the contribution of natural resources for the linkages with poverty alleviation. As we know, during this period, the linkage between uh, donor aid and poverty alleviation came very much to the fore. And there was also a strong recognition of the need to increase the involvement of stakeholders in, in particular uh, areas um, in, in, in an equitable manner. And, and the TOU uh, process was seen as a way of achieving that. So there are currently seven technical operations units, technical operation units in Cameroon. Uh, they vary in, in, in size and extent and complexity, um, and they are often managed, and I've used the parentheses managed, uh, or coordinated by external agents, uh, but often with funding from bilateral uh, arrangements. And one of the ones I'm going to talk about uh, in a bit more detail is, is funded through the German Development Bank, KFW, with a long-term uh, uh, funding commitment. But this raises the issue of s sustainability, which I'll, I'll touch on in a later slide. So the advantages of, of the TOUs is basically uh, an integrated landscape management tool. Um, it's focusing on multi-stakeholder multi involvement in terms of forest management. And looking at management interventions on specific land uses. So, so again, I'll, I'll talk about that when I speak about the uh, specific case study that I'm going to mention. And the idea was to pr promote a platform for dialogue between managers of various different types, of a dialogue that was not happening uh, in, in any of the uh, uh, sectors in Cameroon, particularly timber production, uh, those managing uh, protected areas, industrial agriculture, which is uh, pervasive and prevalent through most of Cameroon, um, industry, habitation, and, uh, and recreation areas, of which there are very few, actually. So the TOUs are administered as a single entity. They each has a, a coordinator who is uh, appointed by the Prime Minister. Um, he or she is advised by a management committee which is made up of all of the stakeholder representatives of all the stakeholders within that TOU, which could be the private sector, it, it could be uh, indigenous groups. Um, and the, the idea of the management committee is that they, it does represent every single interest within that particular uh, TOU. And, Ideally, and conceptually, the key advantage is that all the stakeholders elaborate in and implement a much more holistic um, management concept using this partnership, which entails essentially recognition of trade-offs and negotiating for those trade-offs within that landscape. And this is the one that's particularly contentious and tricky. Um, and the impact of TOUs on, on local population, um, obviously the increased involvement of local people is always a good thing uh, in particular areas. Um, and there was 
um, a very nice, I think, uh, concession on part of the Ministry of Finance, which allowed a certain amount of royalties generated from those particular areas to be put back into the, uh, the communities involved in the, in the, the TOUs. Um, for, for, for example, the forest royalties from timber exploitation, um, income generated from community forest, formal community forest management, um, NCFP uh, harvesting and commercialization, um, and also uh, strong links with the development of village development plans, which were often funded through external agencies. Um, and so there was a strong development component to much of the, many of the TOUs. Uh, the southwest region, which is where I worked for, for many years, um, was split up into four huge TOUs. Uh, the entire region was, was, was basically de desegregated into, into four major um, uh, administrative units, um, each of which uh, had protected areas within uh, and a whole range of land uses uh, as well. Um, there weren't co essentially conservation concessions. These were a mixture of various land uses uh, within each. Um, and the classification within the boundaries was left open. And so there were um, subsequent uh, opportunities to change classifications within each of these particular units. So the Takamanda Morney TOU, which I was involved in the establishment of in 2004, um, just as an example of the complexity of these, these units, um, we have the Takamanda National Park, which was uh, um, upgraded from a forest reserve in 2003 or oh, 2004, sorry, um, and uh, Kagweni Gorilla Sanctuary, which is a small uh, protected area on the, the eastern side of the, the uh, TOU. There was a forest management unit, which was uh, solely uh, focused on a single species of tree, uh, Lafira alata, which is iron wood, um, export uh, wood of uh, high value and, and uh, export quality. And the Morning Forest Reserve, uh, a forest reserve of the old style forest reserve, uh, forest reserve set aside for future production, and the, the, the um, status of that reserve remains uh, as a forest reserve without any uh, protective or, uh, or utilization status. And the other areas around are basically uh, areas for smallholder agriculture, um, agroforestry zones, um, etc. So you can see there's a, a, a strong network, a patchwork, if you like, of different land uses. Um, there are obviously conservation uh, implications. It's home to the Cross River Gorilla, which is uh, the most threatened primate in this particular area of the world. Uh, and concomitantly, uh, strong pressures from the cross-border trade in NTFPs, bushmeat, uh, and timber. And so this TOU was, was particularly uh, affected by uh, international encroachment across the, the border. So in terms of pitfalls of the TOU, because of the fluidity, if you like, of the classification within the boundaries of each, uh, this map actually is, is from Matt Hansen's recent um, land use classification. Um, the red indicates uh, areas of recent deforestation and the blue indicates uh, recent reforestation, but uh, it's all one crop, it's oil palm. Um, and these are um, uh, companies that are, uh, have come into the Mount Cameroon region uh, which is an area traditionally known for its plantation establishment, uh, oil, palm, rubber, uh, and other commodities. Um, and this is um, expansion and planting of oil palm that's happened in the last 10 years. Um, and it just over, um, emphasizes that external forces um, often override local con considerations. Um, and much of this oil palm expansion has, has affected uh, smallholder farmer uh, activities, and most, many of whom have been uh, displaced and moved to other areas. The weak local governments, governance that has been unfortunately uh, plague, plaguing the, the, the TOUs has been a particular problem, problem, and primarily because of a lack of agreement on the, the sort of vision in the landscape by local stakeholders. And another example uh, in, in the um, uh, Corrup TOU, um, there's the Corrup National Park you can t see to the, to, the, to the left of this uh, red blob. This red blob is a new uh, oil palm concession which is sandwiched between a whole bunch of protected areas, but it also contains the highest number of itinerant smallholder farmers in the region. And where are they going to go? They're going to go straight into the, uh, the protected areas. And this was a, a conserva uh, an oil palm concession that was applied uh, without consultation with the, the, the technical operation unit um, stakeholders at all. Um, and uh, this has been a rather contentious um, concession that's uh, the subject of some research that we're doing at C4 as well. So in summary, 
in some ways, the technical operation unit as a, as a sort of political administrative concept was a bit ahead of its time in terms of providing the legal framework for integrated landscape management and was really hamstrung, I think, in many ways by um, the skewed power relations and competing interests that happen within these landscapes. And I think you know, all of us have different perceptions of what should be happening in, in, in landscapes. And it was interesting to hear about uh, in the previous session about landscape metrics, about how you measure performance in landscapes. One, one person's performance may be another person's uh, uh, detriment um, or good performance. And so, you know, it's, it's a very difficult thing to balance how, how you measure uh, uh, landscape performance. And weak governance, uh, which allowed external decisions to be made without consultation with the TOUs um, and the, the authorities therein, was a particular problem. But I have to say, you know, t considering this is 10 to 15 years ago, and, and that the current government and the, and the donors involved were extremely visionary, I think, in actually formalizing the landscape approach on the ground, and really did make a, a concerted effort in terms of management, financing, um, and uh, through the administrative process in getting these things off the ground. And I think that some, some have been more successful than others. And I think that a lot of the pressures that affected the TOUs would have happened anyway, but we don't know how much they've actually mitigated and saved uh, um, certain aspects of livelihoods and, and also conservation as well. So I think that the, the, it was an, a very positive step in the right direction and something that which would, is something that is a basis to, to take forward and, and work with in the future. And I think I shall end there, yes. Great. Thanks, Terry. And, and that's a great presentation. There is a lot of knowledge and experience out there. That's good to know. So whatever the landscape approach is, it is at least not new. Um, OK, we have one more respondent, and that is Yaburu, Yabori Gazul. And again, you will have to present yourself. No problem. Um, I'll just do it off here. OK. So hello, my name is Jaburi Ghazul. I'm professor of ecosystem management at ETH Zurich. Um, what I'd like to do is just present a few ideas uh, and from, that's come out of some of our work um, in the Western Ghats in India, but also uh, reflects quite a lot of work that's being done all around the world. Um, let me see if I can get this to work. There we go. Um, the first thing is, what is a landscape? And we have heard some people trying to define a landscape earlier on today. Um, Terry mentioned it. Was it you, I think? I think you mentioned, gave a definition as well. But I think we need to recognize that while we're all sitting in this room from more or less similar backgrounds, both professionally as well as culturally, many of the people we talk to in the Western Ghats, as well as many other places, have a completely different interpretation of landscape. They may view it as a cultural landscape rather than a physical uh, landscape. They might view it as a spiritual landscape. Um, politicians might view it in a very different way to the way we view it. Um, their economic, uh, you can describe a landscape from an economic perspective. The opportunities available in that landscape, the barriers to development, um, can have, uh, be related to the physical structure of the landscape, but might be interpreted in a very different way from an economic perspective. So I think uh, we need to be very aware that the kind of uh, programs we're advocating in the Western Ghats or in Indonesia or Colombia or wherever it may happen to be, may be interpreted in a very different way. It may not even map against the way people are interpreting the landscape uh, in, their own, in their own place. Um, there's also a wide variety of people who are doing the interpretation. And even in the local uh, communities, there are many different stakeholders, many agents of change, and many of those people may themselves differ in, in what they prioritize in the landscape, what they feel is most important, and indeed how to interpret that landscape. Uh, this is these are just some examples, this list of, of some examples of people who are important people uh, who shape the landscape in various ways, and also who interpret the landscape in different ways in the Western Ghats, uh, where we're doing a lot of our work. Um, coffee farmers are perhaps the most important in terms of the uh, immediate impact on the environment. Uh, but coffee farmers are not just m male coffee farmers. There is also the women who have an important uh, impact on the landscape and in a different way to the men. They respond differently and they, they work with the landscape in a different way. Uh, coffee farmers' children is actually a very important thing that perhaps we're not 
thinking about sufficiently because we're talking about the landscape here and now and maybe for the next few years solving the immediate problems. But when we're talking about a landscape approach, it's not just the spatial extent of the landscape, it's also the temporal dynamics over perhaps uh, year, certainly years, but almost certainly decades as well. But so far, all the uh, solutions, all the, the proposals I've been hearing about are really only thinking a few years into the future. And the reason I refer to coffee farmers' children is because many of those children are getting an education, which is fantastic, but using that education to become lawyers or doctors or businessmen or entrepreneurs in the city. They're not wanting to continue the uh, tradition of looking after the farm. So the landscape in Kurg, where we work in Western Ghats today, is going to be looking very, very different in another 30 years because there'll be far fewer people who are interested in maintaining those coffee farms. So the landscape has got a trajectory, and that trajectory is going to be very different, taking us somewhere which is very different to where we are now. Um, then, of course, there are uh, a whole variety of other people. I'm, I'm not going to go through all of these, but one thing I will mention, and which is, again, something which I've noticed to be a, a major lack here, are companies, um, the corporate sector. They seem to be missing from this room and from this, this forum. Um, Nestle, for example, are doing lots of good things, believe it or not. Um, I hope nobody's from Nestle is from here. Um, lots of good things uh, which are shaping how farmers uh, manage their, their, um, their farms. But they're thinking about sustainability. They're thinking about the future of farming from a very different perspective. They want to maintain their security of supply for the long term. They're not although they call it sustainable farming, they're not necessarily looking at the landscape context. They're just looking at the farm unit scale but they have impact. And the farmers are responding to what Nestle are saying because Nestle is buying the product from them and is there in the field. Um, we probably have far less impact, but of course our ideas are better. But it's no good having better ideas if you're not having impact. So where does this take us? Well, there's this concept of wicked problems, which is another thing that hasn't really been mentioned much, but is actually an old idea. It's 40 years uh, since this idea was first proposed in a really a seminal paper, which should be more widely read. Basically, when we're dealing with landscapes, we're dealing with wicked problems. Why are they wicked? Many reasons, you should read the paper. Um, but a key thing is that we think of the problems in very different ways. We have our perspective, our interpretation, Farmers have their interpretation, laborers have their interpretation, local politicians have a different interpretation. We are all talking across purposes. We're interpreting the problems in different ways. We're, our priorities are very different. Our solutions are very different because we're thinking about different problems. Um, and it's very, very difficult to bring these different, issue, these different values, if you like, together um, because we're not even understanding what each other's values are. So as a result, our goals perhaps coincide sometimes, but very often they conflict. And we're, so often we're not even aware that they conflict. And I'll give you a quick example of that later on. But before I do so, a wicked problem, is, I don't have the time to go through it now, but, but it's, it's, a, it's a gradual process. There's no quick fixes, there's no, solution, there's no clear solutions. It's something that we work through. As we understand the system, solutions will become <coughs> hopefully apparent. We work with those solutions. They, those solutions themselves will throw up new problems. And then we have to work on those problems. Um, there are no optimal solutions. If anybody tells, comes up with a model and says this is the optimal land use uh, strategy that we should pursue, and tell them that they don't know what they're talking about and go back to the drawing board. There are no optimal solutions in wicked problem situations. Um, I've heard the word balance used. In fact, I think Ruth used it, and I apologize, Ruth, but I, I'm going to say that never, ever, ever use the word balance because the word balance is everybody understands what balance is, you know, we want a balanced economy, a balanced land use distribution, but everybody has a different perspective on what it is. We can all agree we want balance, but my balance is going to be very different. I want lots of biodiversity. The farmer's not going to want lots of biodiversity, but we can all agree that we want a balanced system. So there are no optimal solutions. There's no clear balance. Um, and there is no endpoint solution. We cannot solve the problem. The problems will always be there. We just work to get them better and better and better. So let me come back to uh, a very quick example. This is a very, very simple example, again, coming out from some of the work uh, that we're doing. Um, the, you know, there are no rational solutions. It's, everything is dominated. Uh, or you can have rational solutions, but a rational solution at one scale is not going to be rational at a, at a different scale. 
And a simple example is pollination services. Now, you've all heard about pollination services in the news all the time. And in my opinion, although I must say I'm in a minority here, the whole issue is hugely overblown. Um, and we can talk about that later. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is from some of our work. Wild pollinators do improve crop production. Therefore, many scientists are advocating we should conserve natural or semi-natural areas, uh, have high diversity agroforestry systems to maintain pollinators because that has a direct benefit to the farmers through crop production. Um, but the farmers we speak to say, yes, 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 that all sounds good. But if we remove trees, we can do other things which give us other sources of income. In fact, we can actually double our income by removing trees. We recognize that's going to have a cost to the pollination service and therefore the production of coffee, but now we can plant exotic silver oak um, at much higher density than the native trees and plant pepper up the stems of the silver oak. And that doubles the income coming to the farmer. Yes, they lose the pollination services, but that's made completely irrelevant by the other alternative sources of income that they're getting. So this narrow perspective that we scientists and I say we scientists, I know not everybody in this room might be a scientist, but, but it, it, it is often becomes irrelevant when placed in the reality of the complex situations in which we find we're working in. Um, I want to mention the, the uh, yeah, I mean, okay, briefly, um, it, the um, women in, in Kuru maintain uh, honeybee hives. They also tell us that we can cut down all the trees and we don't care if we lose all the wild pollinators because we can maintain honeybee hives. That provides a pollination service. Now, how do you argue against that? I mean, you can, but they have a point. Um, again, rational decision. That's a rational decision that they're making to cut down the trees. They can improve their income. They can improve the, they can improve the diversity of the products that they have. That comes at a small cost. But, and that's a rational decision that they're making at the farm scale. But what happens when you aggregate all the decisions of all the farmers across the landscape? Then we'll have a completely deforested landscape. And that begins to have implications, negative implications for the farmers. It's the scaling up issue that we need to think about in the feedbacks from the aggregated decisions of many farmers, the aggregated rational decisions from many farmers across the landscape has long-term and large-scale implications, which they're currently probably not aware of. Or if they are aware of it, they're discounting it because they can um, have more immediate uh, uh, rewards. So. And this takes me to my final slide, and I have to credit uh, Claude Garcia, who's uh, a scientist who's working with me in ETH Zurich. He's also affiliated to CIRAD as well as ETH. Um, he has promoted the idea of uh, role-playing games, and this comes to the oper operationalization of the landscape approach. How do you get far How do you work with farmers? How do you work with all these different opinions, these different perspectives? And he uses the party approach. It's not actually his approach, but it's been promoted, I think, by CIRAD scientists. Uh, but he's really implemented very effectively, and that is the way we're pursuing at the center of the landscape that Anya mentioned, how we're pursuing uh, management and developing solutions with local farmers. It's very participatory. I mean, There's a play on words. Par the participatory is party. Party stands for problems, actors, resources, dynamics, and interaction. We basically work with the farmers and allow them, facilitate the process of allowing them to identify what the problems are for them. They identify the problems, not us. So they, and their priorities are often different to us, so they come up with problems that we hadn't even anticipated. Um, they identify who are the actors of change, who are the important stakeholders, not us. Um, they identify the resources that are available to them, et cetera, et cetera. And then we create a role-playing game, a physical game, that they all come together, and we uh, encourage them to make decisions and then explore the results, the outcome of those decisions. And they can see that for themselves, and that gets them talking. Um, I don't have time to go into this in any detail, but another important issue is we talk about collecting data. Who is it who's collecting data? What it should be is it should be the, we should be encouraging the farmers themselves to collect the data because that solves, that addresses two issues. First, it addresses the issue that they will collect data on issues that are important to them. So they will identify the priorities that are relevant to them. And if we come up with information and we present that to them, they often say to us, well, that's very interesting, but it's really not that relevant. Um, doesn't matter. Um, and secondly, it empowers them. They can then come to us or to Nestle, for example, and say to, to us, these are our priorities. And actually, we've collected lots of information that we can show you. And it gets them thinking about their own solutions. So it really empowers them. So, so I'll cut it short because I know time is pressing. Um, 
an important aspect of the landscape approach should not be to provide solutions, but to provide the means for local people to collect their own information and understand that information, interpret it through their own networks, and then come to us and say to us, okay, this is what we need to do. How do we, how do we go about doing it? This is the information that we can provide. What can you do to help us? Um, and I will mention one simple example. So we have been working, uh, as I said, in coffee estates in the Western Ghats. We're coming up with all kinds of great solutions to landscape management that benefits the farmers as well as benefits conservation. And Nestle have been doing something similar. They've been looking at how to manage coffee estates to improve production, to, uh, to mitigate the emissions of carbon dioxide, et cetera, et cetera. And so we had all these meetings. And then eventually, I thought to ask some of the farmers, so you know, what is the most important thing to you? What's all, all this stuff that we've been doing? What, what is most relevant to you? What is, the, what is the key barrier? And they said, oh, all your stuff is great, but actually our biggest problem is labor. We don't have enough labor during harvest time. So it's got nothing to do with the landscape so much. It's more to do with their access to labor. And in fact, many of the strategies we were advocating were counterproductive because we were advocating diversification, we were advocating better management of, of leaf, leaf material and so on. And that in, enhances biodiversity. But this means that the laborers who are in short supply don't want to work in those plantations where there is a lot of biodiversity because biodiversity means stinging ants. It means snakes, it means that kind of, you know, spiders. They don't want to work there. And because labor is in very short supply, they can choose where to go. And if you're a farmer, the last thing you want is laborers refusing to work on your estate because you will not be able to harvest the crop. Thank you very much. Um, I have two comments. Uh, uh, two, first to my own comments, and then you will have, get a chance to ask questions. Uh, first, on the private sector in the Landscapes Forum, um, we just had one speaker in the high-level session, and we've had at least one sub-plenary on corporate governance and, and some other discussion groups. So we, we, can, we can talk about that, but I think we covered that base. Um, and then on wickedness, I agree completely with, with what, what you've said here. Um, and I think it's a matter of Instead of looking for those nice, simple solutions that many are engaged in, we need to learn to embrace the wickedness. Wickedness is good. We should like wickedness. Then we can start dealing with the landscapes. Uh, so that's a very good point to make. And, and uh, it's a tough sale to, to the politicians starting talking about heuristics and iterative solutions. They don't like that, but, but we have to make them like it. Okay, so we have a few minutes for... Uh, questions and answers before uh, a short group work on, on uh, specific questions. Um, any questions to any of the presenters? We're going back to Robert and Anja. There were some questions before. We have one over here. I think we're being recorded, so we better talk into the mic. Doug Boucher from the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, for Dr. Gazul, uh, given what the farmers have told you about labor being the main problem, are you working on ways of increasing the biodiversity that reduce labor needs? Uh, ways to re increase biodiversity that would reduce labor needs? Okay, think about that for a minute. Any, any other question? I care. Yeah, I'm Phil Franks from CARE and IIED. A question for Terry. Um, with those uh, TOUs in Cameroon, um, how were the boundaries defined? Through what sort of process, political type process, I mean, with a political perspective, was used to define those boundaries of the landscapes? Okay, great. We'll take one more. Yes. You spoke before, but this is gender. <laughs> Thanks again for giving me this opportunity to ask a second question, but I don't want to sound provocative. Uh, uh, to, in 2005, we had Millennium Ecosystem Report where we propagated that ecosystem-based management is, is the new way. And then 10 years later now, we have a more emphasis on landscape approach. So are we talking about synergies? Are these complementing? Are, is there a distinction between them, uh, between the both of them? Or, when we specifically to, uh, want to emphasize on landscape-based approach, are we trying to take into account the landscape science in general, which has indicators of measuring or monitoring
monitoring landscapes such as fragmentation, porosity, patchiness. Some have an ecological relevance, others have a more social relevance. I don't, I, nothing of an economic relevance comes to my mind now. So my point is that uh, are we trying to uh, look into synergies between different types of approaches available in sustainability science to manage land use systems? I would rather point it that way. Also, the labeling is wicked. Okay, uh, the first question was for, yeah, okay. Okay, again, this is a classic wicked problem. Um, we can work to enhance biodiversity, we can work to enha enhance productivity of the landscape, but then that throws up the new problem of uh, labor shortages and, and the unwillingness of, of people to work in high biodiversity plantations. Um, so we can try to work, s s um, solve that problem, maybe by introducing simple technologies, perhaps. You know, I don't have a solution for that. But that itself will throw up other problems, because the laborers themselves are the poorest members of society. They're the landless. So we would be doing a grave social injustice if we were to put all these people out of work. They are finally empowered to demand higher wages because they're in short supply, finally poorest members of society. Do we really want to go down the route of disempowering them and making them destitute again for the sake of biodiversity and the sake of the relatively rich farmers? Started talking politics there, that's good. I, I think actually both uh, question two and question three are for Terry. No? Just a second, okay. Uh, the boundaries, yeah, that was a, a, a big issue because from the biological perspective, you know, we wanted the boundaries to represent <clears throat> discrete entities in terms of um, the conservation value, but also making sure that the, 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 the smallholder farmer uh, components are also included. Unfortunately, the government of Cameroon insisted that they follow administrative boundaries. So these were, um, at the time it was South South Province, now it's South West Region, but the, the, the subdivisions, uh, subdivisional boundaries were primarily used as the boundaries uh, with some physical features such as rivers, which also corresponded with the admin boundaries. And I, I think that's probably why some of these TOUs have not been so successful as well, because they're, they're a little too large to manage in, the, in their entirety. I just would like to uh, answer to the last question of what's the difference between ecosystem approach and landscape approach. Um, in preparation for this talk, we actually discussed it quite a bit, and I'm giving my personal opinion, which might not be the opinion of everybody else in this room. I don't think that there is a huge difference betwe between the ecosystem approach and the landscape approach. But I do think, and we have heard it many times today, it is about semantics. It's like what you associate with the word. And if you talk about ecosystem, a lot of people associate that with conservation. So it put it into a certain corner, and it didn't actually lead to a large integration. Like most agencies that worked on biodiversity and conservation actually used the ecosystem approach, but it wasn't taken on by the people that actually do rural poverty. So it actually created another silo. To me, the landscape, and I think that's where the real merit in it is, it's the term landscape, everybody has an association with it. And that's where it actually allows it to integrate, and you don't actually think, oh, this is yours, and this is mine. And I think that really is if we, if we are applying it really well, and the question is, how do we actually make it uh, implementationable, then we have a great tool to actually solve like, wicked problems, because it is something that everybody can own. Uh, as you were just saying, from, from what angle we approach it, I think it's a, it is a little bit early to say. Like One of the things we do in the central landscape, we have a team in each central landscape that does an institutional mapping at a landscape scale at the moment. So we're coming from both angles. We're coming from formal and informal institutions and trying to see their lens and their view on that landscape, while we have people that are working on the ecosystems and building it up. And maybe by mid of next year, I can tell you if these two meet, or they just can't meet. OK, thanks, Anya. Uh, maybe it's not an integrated landscape approach, but it is landscapes as an integrating approach or something. Uh, OK. In the uh, interest of time and in the interest of keeping you in the room, uh, we will now move to the group work, and Robert will take over from here. Okay, that's a sort of uh, uncharted territory organizing group work in discussion forum, but uh, it's like with the landscape approach, it's not because it's difficult, we won't do it or try to do it. Uh, c can I ask uh, the room to uh, gather in four, five groups? Uh, you look uh, to your neighbor, people that seem sympathetic or not, and. Uh, you sit together and, 
And, and the, main, the main question is the one that you see behind. Do you think that the landscape approach has a real value for closing the gap between intention and implementation? And if yes, how? Of course, if you say no, you have also to say why. Uh, and uh, uh, you have something like uh, 15, 20 minutes. Uh, so please make groups. And uh, because it's, it's very important for us, because I mean, it's sort of, if, if we are keeping repeating ourselves and uh, not having the, the voice of the, some people from the exterior, we will convince ourselves that we have the solution. And Jabari says that there is no solution. So please. And uh, it's not a question, but anybody interested to participate to the A4 and the Sustainable Landscape Initiative, please, you have the email address here. Thank you.